To start, consider multiplying a number by itself. For example, 4 times 4 equals 16. This can be done with negative numbers as well. Negative 3 times negative 3 equals 9. Remember, a negative times a negative is a positive. Multiplying a number by itself is called squaring, which is a special case of exponentiation, multiplying a number with copies of itself some number of times. We can write 4 times 4 as 4 squared, with the 2 in superscript. This just means multiply two copies of 4 together. We can also consider the inverse of squaring. For example, what number squared is 25? There are actually two possible answers, those being 5 and negative 5, and these are called the square roots of 25. However, we're often just interested in the non-negative solution, which is 5 in this case. 5 is called the principal square root of 25, or simply the square root. This is indicated with a radical symbol. With this idea in mind, you may consider taking the square root of a negative number, like negative 1. Can we find any number on the entire real number line so that squaring that number will give us negative 1? The answer is no. If we choose any real number, we'll find that the square of that number must be at least 0. This can be visualized using a graph. If we define a real function f of x equals x squared, then graphing y equals f of x gives us a shape called a parabola, and this parabola never goes below y equals 0. That may seem like the end of our journey, but let's not give up just yet. Why don't we simply declare the existence of some new type of number to solve this problem? Let's call this number the imaginary unit, written with the letter i, and define it using the equality i squared equals negative 1. This may feel like cheating, but mathematics is about rules, and making up new rules to see where they lead us is a major part of the process. So let's think about what we can do with the number i. We can multiply i by a real number to get some product. For example, we can have 7 times i, or simply 7i. Since i is the imaginary unit, let's call i times a real number an imaginary number. We'll explore this naming choice in more depth later. Anyway, what other operations can we do with real and imaginary numbers? Let's try adding a real number to an imaginary number, an example being 3 plus 4i. This number consists of multiple parts, those being a real part and an imaginary part. Since the word complex can mean having multiple parts, let's call this type of number a complex number. Let's think of a way to visualize these new concepts. First, we already know that we can visualize the set of real numbers as a line, so let's draw the real number line. Next, you might notice that it's possible to visualize the set of imaginary numbers as a line as well. Just take the real number line and multiply each number by i. But notice that anything times 0 is 0. So the imaginary number 0i is really equal to the real number 0. This suggests drawing both the real and imaginary line in the same place, intersecting where both of them contain the number 0. Also, we will draw the lines perpendicular to each other, and with the number 1 and the number i being the same distance from 0, which will be useful later. For now, let's think about how we can represent adding a real number and an imaginary number to get a complex number. If you're familiar with Cartesian coordinates, one solution that may jump out at you is to use the real and imaginary parts of a complex number as coordinates. The real and imaginary lines can serve as the axes of our coordinate system. Indeed, this system works well, allowing us to represent complex numbers as points within a two-dimensional plane. This plane is known as the complex plane. Here are some examples of complex numbers represented as points in the complex plane. Each complex number can also be represented as an arrow pointing from the origin, or zero, to a given point in the complex plane. If you have some experience with vectors, this will likely look familiar to you. Operations on complex numbers are similar to those on real numbers. Adding complex numbers is the same as adding the real and imaginary components separately. For example, quantity 2 plus 3i plus quantity 4 minus i equals quantity 2 plus 4 plus quantity 3i minus i equals 6 plus 2i. Subtraction works in a similar way. 
As for multiplication, you can simply distribute the multiplication to each term. Quantity 2 plus 3i times quantity 4 minus i equals 2 times quantity 4 minus i plus 3i times quantity 4 minus i equals 8 minus 2i plus 12i minus 3i squared. Now remember that we defined i so that i squared equals negative 1, so this becomes 8 minus 2i plus 12i minus 3 times negative 1, which can be simplified and rearranged to 8 plus 3 minus 2i plus 12i, or just 11 plus 10i. With the basics covered, let's move on to applications. You will usually first encounter complex numbers in the context of solutions to polynomial equations. A polynomial is an expression created from variables and constants, where the only operations allowed are addition and multiplication, which can include raising a variable to the power of a positive integer. Although a polynomial can have multiple variables, we'll just focus on single variable polynomials for now. An example of a polynomial is the expression x squared minus 6x plus 25. The quantities being added together are called terms, and the word polynomial itself means many termed. The constants that are multiplying the variables are called the coefficients. Here the coefficients are 1, negative 6, and 25. Note that x squared is the same as 1x squared, which is where the coefficient of 1 comes from. Each polynomial has a certain special property. To begin, let's examine each term of the polynomial, which will have the variable raised to a certain exponent. That exponent is called the degree of the term. We can also find the degree of the polynomial. It's the highest degree of any term of the polynomial. In the polynomial x squared minus 6x plus 25, the highest exponent on x is 2, so the polynomial is considered to be degree 2. Such a polynomial is also called a quadratic polynomial. The Latin word quadratus means made square. This table shows a list of adjectives for a polynomial's degree from 0 to 5. We can consider writing an equation where a polynomial is equal to 0, and we have to find the values of the variable to satisfy the equation. An example is x squared minus 6x plus 25 equals 0. An equation that uses a polynomial like this is called a polynomial equation. Since the solutions are the values of x where the polynomial has a value of 0, they are called the zeros of the polynomial. This is where complex numbers come in. For any degree of at least 2, it's possible to write a polynomial with that degree that has real coefficients, but non-real zeros. Without going into too much detail, this specific polynomial equation that we just wrote has these solutions, x equals 3 plus 4i, and x equals 3 minus 4i. More information on solving quadratic equations can be found in these videos. Polynomial equations are the main reason that complex numbers were first considered. However, perhaps surprisingly, quadratic equations were not the biggest motivator. Instead, cubic polynomials were. Back in the day, mathematicians only cared about real solutions of polynomial equations. So, quadratic equations with non-real solutions were basically just tossed in the garbage. But even when considering only real solutions, problems arose. You may have heard of a quadratic formula for solving quadratic equations. But there is a cubic formula, often unmentioned due to its complicatedness. Even when the solutions themselves are real numbers, the cubic formula doesn't actually work if you completely stay in the real numbers, because you end up having to take the square root of a negative number. To fix this, Italian mathematician Girolamo Cardano came up with the idea of using complex numbers in 1545. However, he apparently wasn't a big fan of his own creation, repeatedly calling complex numbers useless, and referring to using them as mental torture. This was before the time that the geometric representation of the complex plane was used. In fact, Cardano outright refused to accept complex numbers as valid solutions to polynomial equations in their own right. The term imaginary number was coined by a separate figure, French mathematician René Descartes. You may have heard part of his name in the term Cartesian. Descartes used the term in an insulting fashion, in order to contrast these numbers with so-called real numbers, which were the only types of numbers he recognized as legitimate. 
Mathematicians of the time simply didn't understand exactly how useful these types of numbers would turn out to be. Couple that with the term complex in complex number, often being misunderstood to mean complicated, and you get what is famously one of the most confusing sets of terminology in mathematics. A later proposal by German mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss was to replace the term imaginary number with lateral number, because these numbers extend laterally from the real number line in the complex plane, but this never really caught on. Despite their rocky start, complex numbers ended up being widely accepted as extremely useful by the mathematical community. To demonstrate this, let's end by looking at one of the most useful things you can do with complex numbers, modeling rotations. We'll start by observing what happens to a complex number when you multiply it by 1. For example, what is 1 times quantity 3 plus 4i? The answer should be pretty obvious. Anything times 1 is itself. So we just get 3 plus 4i. This makes the number 1 special. And in the context of complex numbers, it is often called unity. Next, we'll try multiplying a complex number by i. For example, what is i times 3 plus 4i? We'll first look at it algebraically. i times quantity 3 plus 4i equals 3i plus 4i squared by distributing. And i squared equals negative 1 by definition, so this becomes 3i minus 4 which can be rearranged to negative 4 plus 3i. Now for a geometric view. Recall that we can represent complex numbers using vector arrows. So let's do that here for both 3 plus 4i and negative 4 plus 3i. Notice that the angle between them is a right angle. This is not a coincidence. If you take some complex number, a plus bi, for real a and b, then you can calculate i times quantity a plus bi as being equal to ai plus bi squared, which is the same as negative b plus ai. Drawing them both as arrows will result in a right angle between them, with negative b plus ai always being a quarter turn, or 90 degrees, counterclockwise from a plus bi. So multiplying a complex number by i results in a counterclockwise rotation by a quarter turn. Notice that i itself is a quarter turn counterclockwise from 1. Multiplying i by itself rotates it to negative 1, and indeed, we know that this is the correct result from the definition of i. Multiplying a complex number by negative 1 is the same as multiplying it by i twice, which is the same as applying two quarter turns, which add up to a half turn, or 180 degrees. Indeed, you can calculate that negative 1 times quantity a plus bi equals negative a minus bi, and the result is a 180 degree rotation of what you started with. Multiplying by negative 1 twice takes you back to where you started, which makes sense since negative 1 squared equals 1. Indeed, this is one way to see that a negative times a negative is a positive. To model a rotation by any angle, we can make use of a handy tool called Euler's formula, one of the many things named after Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. However, fully explaining what Euler's formula is and why it works requires a bit of trigonometry and calculus. So we'll just focus on some basic geometric intuition for now. We can begin by drawing a circle with a radius of 1 centered at the origin of the complex plane. This is called the unit circle. Next, choose a complex number on the unit circle with a certain angle theta from the positive real axis. We've already looked at the special cases of 1, negative 1 and i, but you can choose any complex number on the unit circle that you want. Whichever complex number you choose can be written as e to the power of i theta, and multiplying any other complex number z by e to the power of i theta will rotate z by the angle theta. Again, this is simply a generalization of the previous cases we've looked at. This is one of the ways that complex numbers help to translate geometric problems into algebraic ones. Many other ways exist, but for now, we are done.